Hello, evening, women, Bible study fellowship. Good evening, satellite group. Uh, we are glad to see you too. We see you in faith because you're going to be meeting on Wednesday night. But they are part of our class, and we are so thankful for how the Lord is expanding his kingdom through BSF classes and bringing satellite groups so people have the opportunity to uh, come and be part of an in-depth Bible study where they can know God intimately um, and be part uh, of his church. So we are so excited to be here tonight and uh, we have a surprise for you. We have our area personal with us visiting tonight, Erica. I'm adoring and Lucia too. So if you want to come this way, they have something to share with us. Are we thankful to see them? Thank you so much for having us. I'm Ann Erica. Come on in here, get into the light for recording. And this is Lucia. Uh, so we are your area personnel, and you'll see us from time to time. We come around and we have the blessing to be able to know these women who so faithfully serve you each week. And we act as the liaison between headquarters and your class. So we used to be in a class too, and now we kind of travel around. So if you see us, please say hello. We would love to meet you and get to know you more. Um, and if you have anything you'd like to share, we're always open ears. We have a special message for you from the headquarters. So forgive me, I am going to read it from the paper, but it has some really good stuff in it regarding next year. So this year, as you're working in John, John shows us that God on the move, he's in our world now. He spreads the good news about himself and his truth. Next year in Revelation, we will study major themes rather than specific interpretations. And we're doing this to preserve unity and to also fully focus on Jesus. We will examine the warnings that God has in Revelation, as well as instructions that he has in the seven letters that he gives to the churches. We will explore together the depth and the breadth and the finality of this fallen world that we now know here on earth as we live. This is our hope. Our hope is that you wouldn't miss the chance to engage with not only God's word, but also in the community with his people as you do as you come each week. And we hope that this makes a difference in not only your life, but those who you will invite. So we ask, would you invite your friends and your family? Would you do it now? Would you listen to the Holy Spirit and who he may have you invite for the remainder of John? So that as we move forward into next year, they already have the light, the, admit, the flame of God lit inside of them. This hope and his word that we get to experience every week to unite and mobilize his people, you, to impact the world. Thank you. Isn't that exciting? I hope you are excited as we are to be studying John and then continue with Revelation. So my question is, who are you inviting to come with you? And uh, we needed to extend that invitation. We need to engage and even bring people, you know, with us because this is such an important message. Well, this week we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit in us, the gift that the Lord, the God the Father has given us and Jesus, his son, um, his Holy Spirit. And he is in us, he gives us power to do his work. He gives us power to live in a way that honors and glorifies God. And Jesus has promised that to us. And, and we see, we experience this promise every day. So as we think about that, would you worship with me this beautiful hymn standing on the promises and look at these words as we sing, think of these truths and praise God with us. Would you stand up with me as well? Standing on the promises of Christ my King, to Glory in the 
Lord, our hearts overflow with gratitude for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift that BSF is to each of us to dive deep into your word and to learn more of who you are, your attributes, and your character. So Lord, I pray now that you would be with every woman in this room, every woman in the satellite group, every woman here tonight, Lord, that they would have their ears and their eyes open to more of the truth of who you are. Lord, I pray that you would speak through this lecture, that any words that are not from you would fall away, and that only the words from you would remain. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So I've mentioned before in lecture that I have two children. They are very close in age. They are only 19 months apart. And now they're teenagers, but when they were younger, things were a lot different. And I don't leave them often. I don't travel for work. I don't, I don't travel a lot at all, unfortunately. But uh, when I do have to leave them, the few times that I do have to leave them, there is a whole lot of prep work that goes into leaving your children, whether that's when they're younger, arranging for babysitters or family members to take care of them. There's a lot of prep work, a lot of scheduling work. Now that they're older and some of them can drive, um, there's a lot of prep work of making sure they know where they're supposed to be and when, and then making sure they actually get there. There's prep work on the laundry, making sure it's done, or making sure that they do it when I've told them to. Um, and goodness knows, there's a lot of prep work that happens in the kitchen, which is stocking the fridge, stocking the pantry, prepping meals, and all of these things. And then there's the emotional prep work. I need to sit and talk with them. I need to tell them what to do in case of an emergency. I need to tell them how to reach me if they need to. I need to tell them when to expect me back and how long I'll be gone. And I do all of this, even though it's a ton of work while I'm also preparing to go on a trip. I do all of this because they're my children and I want them to be cared for well in my absence. And I want them to know I love them. And as we go into this part of John, Jesus is preparing to soon leave earth. And he starts to give this special kind of care towards his disciples by promising them the Holy Spirit. So a few weeks ago, we talked about how the narrative of John has slowed down tremendously from, say, where we were back in September and October. The narrative has slowed down a whole lot. And the, the fancy theological word for this is narrative time dilation. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that it's a thing. But it just means when the author slows down the narrative so much because every conversation matters. Every moment matters. There is significance to every minute here. So many thanks to John the author. We now get this privilege of eavesdropping, if you want to say, on this private conversation between Jesus and his disciples. So this week we only had 16 verses, but it is deep and it is rich. And we could literally spend hours tonight studying these verses. 
And our focus is the Holy Spirit. That was our doctrine this week, the Holy Spirit. So we'll be looking deep into the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity. So we're in John chapter 14, starting in verse 15. And we're going to talk about tonight that the Holy Spirit promises believers his presence, his power, and his peace. His presence, his power, and his peace. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth of God. The Holy Spirit causes us to repent of our rebellion. He points us to the cross to find cleansing. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to live out our new life in Christ. So tonight we're going to have two divisions. And the first division is the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit is division one. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you're going to turn to John 14, starting in verse 15. Now, this is the first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus has spoken of the disciples' love for him. Now, we've spoken often of how he loves the disciples. But this is one of the first times when he's speaking of the disciples' love for him. And it's also some of the very first mentions of the Holy Spirit. So, let's think about where the disciples were emotionally, mentally, where were they? They were pretty devastated, confused, perplexed, or bewildered, misunderstanding. They had more questions than answers because Jesus had just rocked their world. He had told them he was going to leave. The man that they had been with for the last three years is going to leave them. And in verses um, 15 to 18, he tells them that he's going to send a comforter. He's going to send the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. And the spirit will be their guarantee of eternal life. Well, that didn't help bring any clarity to the situation. They still had more questions. But if you remember back, a few weeks back, we studied John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus told the disciples that truth was a person. He said this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in John chapter 8, Jesus is linking obedience to his, obedience to his word with having true knowledge, which results in life transformation. And then here, in chapter 14, he's reiterating some of those same concepts, and he repeats this teaching. He says in verse 15, if you love me, Keep my commands. It's not that if we love Jesus, we are obligated to obey. We're not obligated to keep his commands, but rather obedience is a certain inevitable expression of affection for Christ. It's an inevitable expression of affection for Christ. Salvation is not based on anything we do. We do not earn our salvation by any form of obedience at all. But true salvation will generate a response of obedience. A loving relationship with Jesus is evidenced by doing what he says. And true love for the Lord manifests itself in obedience. If we love him, we will obey him. But Jesus is going away, he's told the disciples. And so they're confused. How are they going to hear? How are they going to understand? How are they going to even remember all that he has said? The Holy Spirit. Jesus has promised the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will counsel them. And just as they have found every word that Jesus has said for the last three years to be this rock-solid foundation for their lives, the Holy Spirit will be the same. He will be their comforter. Or your translation may have said counselor or an advocate. For many, many centuries, translators, Bible translators and scholars, have had much difficulty Finding an English word to translate this Greek word, parakletos. That is the Greek word here. So let's look. What is a parakletos? A paraclete, which is where the word comes from, a paraclete in Greek was an attorney, specifically a defense attorney. So if you had some kind of problem with the law and you needed somebody to represent you, you called your paraclete. Now, paraclete is two words, comes from two Latin root words. Para, meaning alongside or beside, and then cleat, meaning to call. So the paraclete was someone that you called to come alongside you and help you in your defense. So the name comforter is used in many English translations, and that is a good word. 
Um, but it doesn't imply like comfort, like human comforts that we normally think of. Uh, it doesn't mean like a shoulder to cry on or a comfy chair or a cozy blanket or comfort food like mac and cheese or chocolate, something like that. It comes from, the word comforter comes from a Latin root meaning with strength, with strength. And so the Holy Spirit absolutely does comfort us in our pain and in adversity. But more than comfort, he encourages us, he strengthens us, and he enables us to carry on. So a comforter is someone who comes to strengthen you. It's not that he came to wipe your tears after the battle. He came to give you strength to go to battle. The term counselor is also used, which is also a good English word, um, but it, it should not imply in our minds like a high school counselor or a therapist. A paraclete is an advocate or a counselor in the courtroom, per se, someone who could defend your case during a trial. And so just as Jesus is our advocate before God the Father, the Holy Spirit stands by us. When we are overwhelmed with our sin, we are overcome with our sinfulness, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. He reminds us that we are justified, that we are made clean in Christ, and that he guarantees our salvation. There is the knowledge that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ is a great comfort to me. We grasp this because of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we're able to cling to the promise and stand on the promise that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So the promise of the Holy Spirit was given here by Jesus. And the disciples knew that the, Holy, that the Holy Spirit had come upon Old Testament believers all throughout the Old Testament. When God asked them to do a specific task, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit would come upon them. If you studied PPKV with us last year, you remember so many times when we saw the Spirit of God come upon prophets and other people throughout the Old Testament to, for them to accomplish a specific task. But that was before Jesus came to earth. And so now Jesus is telling them something new. He's saying the Holy Spirit, God himself, is coming to dwell in you, and he will never leave. The Holy Spirit would be in them in a new and a powerful way. And the book of Acts tells us even more about what this looks like in the early church at Pentecost. So Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And the term orphans in this part communicates helplessness. And Jesus is promising his disciples that he is not going to leave them without help. He is not going to leave them without help. We see here the heart of Jesus to help and to sustain and to protect and empower his children. Jesus would come to them after the resurrection. Yes, that is true. But he would also be with them always in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the disciples had to be completely confused by this point. And I can have some sympathy for that because I still have difficulty wrapping my head around how our God is one God in three persons, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. And over the years, there have been many different analogies and illustrations to try to explain this. And there really just isn't one in, in our world today. And I don't think there will ever be one because our God is what we call transcendent, meaning he is beyond us. He is past what our minds can comprehend. And like the disciples, we are called to believe with awe and wonder and faith. The Holy Spirit is God. We should refer to him as he and not it. He is not a force. He is not an influence. He is a person, even though he's invisible. He shares all the attributes of the Godhead, and yet he resides in believers. That is incredible. Verse 19, in verse 19, this truth shines forth. Verse 19 says, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. So the whole, Jesus is giving his disciples a guarantee of eternal life by giving them the Holy Spirit, who is eternal. And the disciples really won't understand this until after the resurrection, and then they'll start to put some of the pieces together. But Jesus tells them at this point, 
He tells them before it happens for a number of reasons. And one of them is to give them hope in the dark days that are ahead because Jesus knows what's coming. He knows what the cross is going to entail. And he wants to give his disciples hope for what's coming ahead. The resurrection is going to completely change their thinking. And he wants them to understand this truth about God that they can grasp right now. The Father is in Jesus. Jesus is in the Father. The believer is in Jesus. And Jesus is in the believer. This is perfect unity statement. This is something we have to believe in faith rather than believe in our minds. We should believe it with our minds, but to try to understand it in our minds before we believe it in faith is not going to get you very far. It is not something we can understand in our minds. We have to believe it in faith because Jesus is talking relationally and he's talking about the closest relationship that we have with the Father. So do you have this close relationship with the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit? Is that a relationship you can say is present in your life? Our eternal life begins when the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And maybe like me, you've grown up in church for most of your life. Maybe you can't ever remember not being a part of church, not going to church. And so maybe you know a lot about God. But maybe you've also realized that there's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Paul talks about this in the New Testament. He says we are to believe into Jesus. And every person who believes into Jesus is in Christ. That's not just knowing about God. That's believing in God. The New Testament over and over emphasizes this mystical union of the believer in Christ. Just as Christ is in the Father, so the believer is in Christ and he is in the believer. This is called union with Christ. We're going to talk about it more next week. But it's possible because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to be united with Christ. And because of that, we can know God by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes us conscious of our sinful nature. He, is he, he can highlight our sins. He leads us to repentance. He gives us the ability to understand God's truth. And he leads us to turn to Jesus when we need forgiveness and salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, we remain dead in sin, blind to all things of God. Verse 21, Jesus repeat, repeats some similar words. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. He is reiterating over and over that a person shows that he or, tree, he or she is truly a disciple of Christ if she or he truly loves the Lord. If she obeys, to love him is to obey him. To love him is to obey him. So if I've made obedience seem easy these last few minutes, that is definitely not my intention. I know that obedience is not easy, and I don't throw that word around flippantly. We struggle in our world, we have everything shouting at us to not obey the Lord, to not submit to God and his word. But, and in our sinful hearts will always pull us towards disobedience. But the more we walk with Jesus, the longer we are in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he gives us the desire to obey. The Holy Spirit enables us to obey. Obedience is not easy. But it is the outflow and the overflow of love for God. So verse 22, we have Judas. I want to be clear that this is, your, your Bible should have had somewhere in parentheses that this is not Judas Iscariot. So this is not the Judas who is going to betray Jesus. We don't know much about this Judas. We think that his name may have also been Thaddeus. We don't know very much other than that, but it, he is, what we do know is that he is definitely not Judas Iscariot. So make sure that you've got that distinction. But Judas asks this question in verse 22, and Jesus doesn't really answer his question. He's done that before in the Gospel of John. He doesn't actually answer the exact question, but he knows what the people need to hear. And so he replies, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. This is similar words, but there's a slight shift. Did you catch it? 
Some versions say, anyone who loves me will keep my word. This is similar language, but Jesus said earlier that those who loved him would obey him. But here he's saying, those who love me will obey my teaching, or those who love me will keep my word. There is an inseparable relationship between affection for Christ and love for his word. An inseparable relationship between affection for Christ and love for his word. And then John moves in, in the narrative, Jesus says, this wonderful expression about God making his home with us. You know, there's something really wonderful about being home. But the statement is true. There's no place like home, right? I mean, home is just where we can kick off our shoes and we put on our comfy clothes and we go sit in our spot on the couch. And it's just home. Who's a homebody? Anybody homebodies? I'm a homebody. I love being home. I love it. And yet we have this beautiful picture here of when the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, we are at home with God. It's amazing. Jesus is going to develop this picture more next week in John chapter 15 when he talks of abiding in him with the branches and the vine. But this week, this is what I want to emphasize about home. The more we love him, the more we obey him, the more we are at home with him, he is at home in us. He is at home in us. So this is our first principle. The Holy Spirit enables believers to know, love, and obey God. The Holy Spirit enables believers to know, love, and obey God. Do you regularly thank God that he did not leave you to figure out this life on your own, but he gave you the Holy Spirit? Do you regularly thank him for the gift that that is? How do you express your love for God through obedience? How do you recognize when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin? Are you aware that the Holy Spirit is always, always with you? So our second division is verses 25 through 31. And this division is titled The Work of the Holy Spirit. And in verses 25 and 26, Jesus tells the disciples more about what the Holy Spirit will do. And so Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is both going to teach the disciples new things, and he's going to remind them of the things that Jesus has already taught them. So Jesus knew the human limitations of the disciples. They were regular humans like me and you. They weren't superhumans. They weren't super Christians. They were just regular people. And Jesus knew that they were, they were limited humans. And you know what we do as humans? We forget things. We forget sometimes important things. And even in 2024, when we have these fancy phones that are supposed to remind us of all the things we're supposed to do, we still forget things. And the disciples were the same <laughs> way. Jesus knew that they, would, they might forget some of the things that he taught them. And so part of the Holy Spirit's job, particularly for the disciples, was to remind them of the things that Jesus had taught them. This was specifically important for the disciples because many of the disciples were charged with the task of writing the gospel message and they needed to get it right. So the Holy Spirit helped them. He breathed out. The Bible says the Holy, the Holy Spirit breathed out the very words of God as the human authors wrote the scriptures. And so for us today, this teaching that the Holy Spirit breathed out has been written down for us in the Bible. We have this gift today in God's word. And the Holy Spirit now teaches us, he reminds us when we study each day, he reminds us what the disciples and the other human authors of the scripture wrote down. And so even though the Bible was written thousands of years ago, it was inspired or breathed out by the Holy Spirit. The author is still alive. So when you sit down and you do your lesson each week, do you ask the author to help you understand it? Do you ask him to illuminate things to you, to speak to you through it, and to empower you to obey it? This is also part of the reason why we can have so much confidence in the accuracy of the Gospels. 
because these accounts do not rest simply on what Matthew or Mark or Luke or John actually remember. We know that the Holy Spirit came and breathed out the scriptures through them. In verse 27, this is one of the most beautiful verses in all of John. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you stopped and savored it this week. Verse 27, I want to read it. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Jesus promises his peace. His peace, his peace that he speaks of here is the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit that will remain with the disciples forever. This is the legacy that Jesus passes on. Jesus didn't own anything other than a robe, which was taken from him when he was crucified. He didn't have an IRA, he didn't have a bank account, he didn't have real estate, he didn't have a trust fund. He didn't have anything of worldly value to pass on. He passed on peace. This is a monumental legacy. Peace that is far more valuable than the richest earthly inheritance. And it's the same peace that he passes to you and to me today. This peace is like nothing the world gives. The world's peace relies on resources and the absence of trouble. God's peace doesn't rely on resources. God's peace is within God himself. And it doesn't rely on external circumstances or the absence of trouble because we all know there will never be an absence of trouble. Peace is found within God himself. The peace of God begins when we have peace with God. Only when we're in a right relationship with God can we have any hope or peace in our lives. And Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we have peace with God. Jesus' Jesus's peace calms our troubled minds, and he calms the fears in our hearts. And we all know that being a believer does not exempt us from fearful situations or from troubled times. But we can say firmly with the Psalms, we can stand on the promise of the Psalms that when I am afraid, I will trust in you. So, are you going through a difficult or a stressful time right now? How are you standing on the promises of God during those wakeful night hours? When you wake up in the morning and that trouble, that worry is the first thing on your mind, how do you stand on the promise of God when it's the thing that your mind drifts to every spare moment of the day? How do you stand on the promise of God in that moment? Do you claim his peace? The Holy Spirit is there to help you experience peace, even when the world is crumbling around. In verse 24, Nope, I'm sorry, that's not right. Next, we're on verse 28. There's a statement that may have been puzzling to you. The Father is greater than I. This ties back into verse 24, which is what Jesus said earlier when he said that his words are not his own, but he only speaks the Father's words. So this is a difficult statement, but Jesus is not saying that the Father is superior to the Son. Remember, one God, three persons. The Father is not superior to the Son, but the Son does take a submissive role of obedience in the Father's will in his human existence. In order to be our Redeemer, Jesus had to humble himself. He had to take on the limitations of humanity, not of deity, of humanity. And he did this willingly. And so while the horrors of the cross were coming before him, Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. So in this, we see immense power, great strength of character, and immeasurable love of Jesus. Submission is not inferiority. Jesus was about to submit to the cruel hands of men in submission to his Father's will. But submission is not inferiority. 
Jesus told his disciples, I will say much, I will not say much more to you now, for the prince of this world is coming. Notice that, is coming. Notice that Satan had to come. This is a reminder to us that Satan is not omnipresent, and Satan certainly has no hold on the Lord of glory. Jesus was about to overcome sin and death and all the powers of hell. And in his darkest hour, he was right in the center of his father's will. And this is the most peaceful place to be in the whole universe. And you and I can know this peace too in our darkest hour because Jesus has walked that road for us. So Jesus told his disciples this would happen ahead of time. So they would begin to recognize God's sovereign plan in his death, in his resurrection, and then in his ascension. And then they would also recognize it in the provision of the Holy Spirit. Verse 29 tells us a key phrase that we've been watching all throughout John's gospel. And I want you to listen for it. Listen for the key phrase. Your ears should perk up. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. You will believe. Remember the purpose of John's gospel? He told us in chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus told the disciples in this private conversation was to strengthen their faith. He was bolstering their faith as Jesus knew the dark days that were ahead of them. And part of that bolster, part of that strength giving included the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' greatest delight was found in doing his father's will. The cross was painful. Painful doesn't even feel like the word to use. Agonizing, excruciating. But in a mysterious way, it was also a delight for Jesus because he looked forward to delighting and obeying his father's will. And because Jesus, because of Jesus' obedience, you and I never have to feel abandoned and helpless in this life because we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus may have departed from earth in his earthly body, but the Holy Spirit is just as much a holy and an almighty and an ever-present companion as Jesus was with his disciples when he walked on this earth. So our second principle is this, the Holy Spirit enables believers to face the world with overcoming peace. The Holy Spirit enables believers to face the world with overcoming peace. The Holy Spirit grounds us in God's truth, which are words of life and power. He brings us into a relationship with God and he grows us in our faith with him. And he stands alongside us through every single moment. He enables us to experience the peace of God in every single situation. And he guarantees our eternal life. And because of the Holy Spirit, we are never alone. And we have the power to live as God's obedient children. So are you letting life's troubles and life's stresses get the better of you? In what situation do you need God to give you his peace so that your heart is not troubled, but trusting? In what situation do you need the Holy Spirit to move your heart from trouble to trusting? Only the peace of God can do that. A few minutes ago, I told you how I prepared my children for when I was go going to go out of town. And when they were much, much younger, uh, there was this, uh, one trip I had to go out of town, and it was for a, a lengthier time than I usually went. It was probably the lengthiest time at that point in time that I'd been away from them. And so in preparation, I went to the Dollar Tree, and I got them a little gift for each day. And I put them in brown paper sacks, and I put their names on them, and I put Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera. And it was just obviously something very small, piece of candy, a small toy or whatever. But I wanted them to have something to open each day I was gone because I wanted them just to remember that their mom loves them, that I'm coming back, and that I care for them, and I miss them, and all of those things. And every day we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. He promises us an ever-abiding presence. 
He promises us the power to illuminate scripture to us, to light a light into this scripture like no commentary or nothing else ever will. He will reveal sin to us. He will highlight sin quicker in my life than anybody else. And he promises to give us his peace, his peace that passes all understanding. How are you delighting in this gift today? How are you taking comfort that he never, ever leaves you alone? How are you savoring the gift of Bible study and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you through the study of the scriptures? How are you seeking his peace for your troubled heart? Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us alone, but you chose to send the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that this is a promise that we can stand on. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit and for how he illuminates our eyes to all the truths of who you are, Lord. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.